HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth, where we're exploring all sorts of business topics. Experts from around the world, join me, your host, Diane Helbig, for a conversation where they share their expertise with all of you. Take what you need, when you need it. Featured on Inc.com, Forbes, and MSNBC's Your Business, this podcast is recognized as one of the best podcasts for small business, sales, leadership, social media, and more. When it comes to business, Accelerate Your Business Growth has got it covered. And now on with the show. My guest today is Dr. Valerie Friedland. Valerie is Professor of Linguistics at the University of Nevada, Reno. An expert on the relationship between language and society, she's co-author of the book Sociophonics, no, I'm sorry, Sociophonetics, I should learn to read, and writes for various journals such as Nature and American Speech. Her language blog is featured in, on Psychology Today, and her lecture series, Language and Society, appears for the great courses. She's working on her first book to be published by Viking Penguin. Thanks so much for joining me today, Valerie. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. I, I'm excited to have you here. We're going to be talking about you know, the importance of language um, in business and Boy, I know that I say to my clients an awful lot that words matter, um, right? And that's just part of it, part of it. A small it. part, right? That's the yeah. thing that we focus on, but that's actually one of the smallest parts of what matters. Yeah, right. So I'm so glad we're having this conversation because I think it is, it is really, really important for small business owners to um, be listening to this. So let's start with some of the research in... Um, you know, the sociolinguistic research, what are some of the key findings um, that you think could have an impact on organizations? Well, you know, there's a lot of different angles depending on what your interest is and, and sort of what your, your goals are. And one is, of course, uh, in what's been very popular now is sort of the idea of implicit bias in language and in hiring practices and um, sort of employment culture. A lot of times we overlook the role of language in either continuing uh, sort of inherent bias or helping to promote a more diverse and equitable workplace. So that's one area where there's some research that suggests that how we word things when we're looking for employees can actually affect the outcome of the diverse pool of candidates we might get. So just the way in which we phrase things, the kinds of adjectives we use, um, those sorts of things. Um, that's one area of research. And of course, there's also the area of research on how how we name things or how we brand things can actually help or hinder uh, consumer perception. So that's another area that, of course, could be quite interesting. Um, and then there's also just the general findings on workplace culture in terms of how, depending on who you are from a social perspective, uh, gender, for example, race, age, 
we have different norms for what we expect people to say and how we phrase things. And these can actually affect our interaction. So for example, women historically haven't had as much power in the workplace as men. And so that has shaped somewhat the kinds of language forms that are open to them to use. Uh, it, for example, they get interrupted more often in meetings uh, than men do. They might use more mitigated um, or hedging language than men do because they don't have the economic and uh, social power that men have to make sure that what they say will happen. So they have to mitigate it or make it softer or gentler to get it across. Of course, the problem is, as uh, research shows, that this often hinders women's advancements because they're not considered yeah. aggressive or assertive enough. So there's a variety of ways in which language affects business practices. And, and this is, so I'm listening, this is so incredible. And I'm listening to this and I'm the thought that's coming into my head is that it's not necessarily something that's intentional, like, you know, putting together a, a job description, if you're looking to hire somebody, it's, it's not necessarily that people are framing it in a way to get a certain result. It's that this is how they're raised or wired or it's habit, right? It's habit. Yeah. We all learn habits. Um, that are part of the culture in which we're raised. Um, and one of the things, of course, is who you are depends on what those cultural biases will be. And we're usually unaware of them. So it's not that anybody's trying to do anything. It's mm -hmm. just that we're so used to being in our own little zone and in our own lane that we don't understand that people are in the lane next to us and they might be not be able to merge with ours because of the way that we behave linguistically um, in terms of how we word advertisements, how we word um, uh, job hiring posting, how we word messages that the organization is sending out. It may make people feel not included, just that they don't see themselves in that. It might not even be that they're isolated, simply that they don't see the language that makes it re them realize it's relevant to them. So these are the things we have to look out for. And of course, we're very unaware of them. And that's why linguists come in handy here and there. Wow. Okay. So, uh, you know, where, where to begin with this? Um, yeah. <laughs> I know there's a lot. And, and this is five podcasts worth probably of unpacking. No kidding. So I know. So much, there's so much um, that has to do with how we talk. I mean, it also ranges to things like how to give us good Zoom talk. You know, we, we are not trained to do that. And there are a lot of things we fall back on when we are speaking in person that allow us a little bit of flexibility in, in, in keeping an audience and engaging people yes. that we don't have on Zoom. And again, yeah. linguistic habits, um, our unawareness of them can often make, for example, Zoom meetings seem like they last 12 hours. So all of those things are actually things that linguistic deal, linguistics deals with, in addition to looking at theoretical and cognitive aspects of language. Okay. Talk to me a little bit about generational divides, because this seems to be like a really hot topic. What we have something like five different generations in the workforce right at once right now. So how how is that how is all of this impacting? the language. Well, you know, yeah. one thing that we find over and over again, when we look at sociolinguistic research, starting from the very earliest sociolinguistic research, which most people don't realize has been going on for a long time. It was actually in the early 1900s in a Swiss village, uh, Charmé, uh, by a, a researcher named Louis Gachot, who looked at language change in that community and found that it was young people and women that were ahead by almost a generation in new forms coming into language. And what's really interesting is if you look at every research study that's been done since that time, you find the same basic findings, that it is the young and it is the female that lead in language change. So what we, what we take, can take from that is there's obviously something beneficial to people to have language change. And if it, what, there weren't, we would still speak old English. And since none of us can recite Beowulf very easily, we don't clearly. Uh, so language change is something natural. It's also something beneficial. And we tend to dislike it, which is why we get into problems across generational divides. We have this golden age theory that at some point in the past, there was a perfect social 
uh, cultural linguistic realm in which we all survived and lived and thrived. And now that's gone. And it's the young people that are responsible for that, right? So we have this belief about sort of degradation over time in our society, in our politeness, in our linguistic forms. Yeah, which of course are all interrelated because we also think young people tend to be less polite. So there's all this that has to do with general cultural beliefs about language and societal change and how it's always for the worse. So there's that side of it that's from the older person perspective. Then there's side of it for a younger person's perspective that we need to be able to use language in ways that can give us expressions of community with our peer group and also allow us to evolve in ways that might benefit us, right? And these are things we don't tend to think about when we're you know, 12. We're not trying to learn language so that we can evolve in a way that will make us a better speaker or allow us to be sort of um, trendy or hip or urban sounding. But mm -hmm. the essence of the changes that we pick up actually allow us to do that. And we're very sensitive to that as children. We're not as sensitive to it as adults. And in fact, we are not able to pick up language change as adults in the same way we are able to with um, as, as children. A lot of this has to do with cognitive plasticity, but also a lot of its motivation and our peer group structure, which is very different in our younger years. So you put all that in a pot and, and boil it together and you end up with drastic differences in the speech of older speakers and the speech of younger speakers. This is fine as long as older speakers only talk to older speakers and younger speakers only talk to younger speakers, but that's of course not what happens, especially in workplaces. And so the trick is to understand A, that language change isn't bad, and B, as a younger speaker, that there are different norms for use of language in a workplace environment that might be more formal and in a social environment that might be less formal. And we have to be very savvy in using the right and appropriate features. Of course, the problem comes when what our norms for that differ by generations. And I think that's where we get into the most problems. Wow. Okay. Now, I, I, I oh gosh, there's a question I want to ask you, but I, I want to stay on point. So if I'm leading an organization, and it's important to me that the communication is effective with everybody and, and that that bleeds into uh, listening and respect and tone and, and all of those things. What, what are some things that a leader can do to mitigate some of this? Well, there are a lot of, of different options that a leader has um, in order to make sure that communication is effective and fair and equitable. One thing, of course, is to be very clear because what we realize is workplace culture is often not explicit. So huh. we might just assume that everybody has the same norms that we mm -hmm. do because we're so in our own head. And as a leader, a lot of times we don't realize that maybe uh, you know, we're overseeing a, a bunch of people from a variety of backgrounds, and they may have different ideas about what's appropriate. Mm -hmm. So being explicit about what we expect linguistically is a good start. Uh, we do that a lot of times with clothing choices, right? So in some workplaces, we know that mm -hmm. it's formal attire. In some workplaces, we know it's informal attire. But we hardly ever uh, articulate our desires for how people should talk to one another or the types of communication we have. So you want to model that in the communication you put forth. Um, and you also maybe want to be explicit that my expectation is that when we, you know, have conversations between two colleagues, it can be informal. When we have conversations with clients, then we will need to be formal. Here are some types of formal language. Um, use mitigation for politeness. So that would th be things like, maybe we want to do this instead of bald commands. Let's do this or do this. Uh, that depends really on, on the types of interactions you want to have. So there are a lot of different choices in how you could phrase things. If you also, if you are interested in having an assertive kind of 
of atmosphere, then you probably want to go the opposite direction and say, okay, here are some examples of the way we could phrase things. You don't have to know the linguistic names for them. You could model them, give examples of the types of language that you consider appropriate. So that's one good way to make sure that you're being explicit in the types of communications that you want your employees to have. Another way is to also be aware in meetings of how the distribution of talk is occurring. And this oh. is really towards a fair and equitable workplace. So mm -hmm. a lot of times what we find is people come to the table or the conversation with different expectations for what's appropriate in terms of how they should contribute, how others should contribute, and how those turns at talk should happen. Um, so we have something called turn transition cues, which means that we understand from certain subtle cues that speakers give off when they're talking, where it's okay for me to break in and where it's not. Sometimes it will be the tone of voice. Sometimes it's um, as we lower our intonational pattern towards the end of a sentence, it is saying, okay, I'm almost done. So here you can break in. A lot of times up talking means I'm not done. And this is one of the reasons that women probably up talk more because they have a harder time maintaining control of the floor. Other things are pauses that are silent. If you pause, it opens the opportunity for someone to take the floor. If you use, def use a filled pause like um or uh, that indicates to the audience you're not done yet. So we know all these things uh, as we communicate, but we might know them differently. So one thing to do is when you're a leader and you're in a meeting and you're noticing that terms that talk are not equitable, meaning the same people are talking all the time and some people hardly ever seem to talk. You may have assumed it's because those people have nothing to say or because they're not assertive or however you wanna phrase it from an adjective standpoint. But the reality is a lot of times it's because they're not given the opportunity to talk and you might be losing out on a really good contribution mm -hmm by not giving them the space to do that. So as a leader, then you could do a number of different things. You could say, here, we need to be aware of the fact that we are talking over people or we're interrupting people or we're not pausing for long enough so that everybody gets a turn. So I'm just gonna go around the room and have everybody contribute. That would be one way. Another would be to, to notice in previous meetings how that distribution occurs. So if John is talking a lot, but Sally isn't, then try to direct conversational turn opportunities to Sally. Um, and if you start modeling that, then people might be better at distributing those turns of talk themselves after they get used to the way that you're laying it out. So there, there are a couple of different ways that you can ensure good communication and clear communication as a leader. I love that. That, that and oh my gosh, as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, meetings I've been in, like board meetings I've been in, um, uh, work meetings, you, you name it when, when that goes on. Another thing that I've noticed is uh, people who can't regulate their emotion when they speak. So, uh, for example, someone who, for whatever reason, just seems to be angry, and that's the way they communicate, mm, which doesn't right. really lend itself to open dialogue and problem solving. No, but a lot of times that's, again, something that people are not aware of in their own speech. And it's shocking to me how little we actually have conversations about conversation, right? I mean, we yeah. talk about a lot of other things in workplace culture, uh, but we don't really talk about um, tone of voice or uh, types of talk that can hinder communication in ways that don't help business practices uh, move forward. So I think the big first question would be, is there something that is truly making that person angry? And that's not something linguistics can fix, right? So if someone yeah. has a bad attitude, then that's a, that's a different question about whether they fit into that workplace culture at all. The other side of it could be simply that they don't realize that they're using very directive kinds of speech. So a lot of times mm. bossiness comes across because people have different norms for the way they phrase things. If I always say do this, um, so for example, mm. an unmitigated command instead of a, a, a sort of a communicative suggestion. So if I could say, 
go there and pick up that file versus, hey, why don't we go down to Sally's office and grab that file and see what we can make of it? So one of them would come across as quite aggressive. Yeah. Um, and the other one would come up as a sort of building community. And some people just don't realize that they're using very assertive language and different cultural backgrounds actually can make it that difficult for people to see, especially if English is not their first language. So there's a lot of that that can come into it. Um, and some languages don't have the same kinds of mitigators as, as English. Some languages are much balder in how they phrase things. And so people may not realize how they're coming across. So I think the first question would be, why is that person using that kind of language? Is it something about their lack of fit culturally? And that's a problem that needs to be dealt with in a different way. Or is it a difference in cultural background? Or is it a difference in the types of linguistic forms that they use where perhaps they don't use polite markers very often. So things like, please, thank you. Could we, might we, maybe all of those mitigate and soften. And those can really make you come across as a, a team player in a way that uh, bald ones don't, bald forms don't. The other thing is also pronoun choice. Uh, if you use a lot of I pronouns, that can often make it seem like you're not a team player and that you're only self-interested. What we find is leaders use a much higher rate of, of other directed pronouns. So they use we, inclusive we, to show mm -hmm. that they're part of a team or an organization. And they use they, showing that they often acknowledge and recognize others' contributions. Um, so uh, another thing that might be coming across in an angry person's speech or something that's assertive like that is that they use a lot of self-facing pronouns rather than other facing pronouns, which hmm. kind of isolates them. Right. That's so interesting. Do you know why so many people like people I'm related to <laughs> say the word like? all the time? Well, that's a very interesting question. And yes, that, that's, that's actually a whole podcast in itself. But what was <laughs> interesting is how you introduced that. Um, you said people like the ones I'm related to uh, say like all the time. And what's really interesting is that use of like was actually despised about 50 years ago. Uh, so what goes around comes around, right? So that yeah. when we look back in the history of English, the uh, verb like is actually quite old. It dates back about a thousand years. It was leak on in old English. And that gradually evolved into all these other like uses where like was used as an adjective. So swan-like, uh, buffoon-like. Uh, that was one of the other earliest uses. And then it started getting used as a preposition. Uh, like the sky, um, and, con and then as conjunction. So he went to the store like my mother did, right? That's a conjunctive use. Mm -hmm. That actually was despised as well. So as we evolve wow. into using a word differently over time, it has its haters for <laughs> generations until it becomes so normal, we don't notice that we do that very thing that people despised 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And that is where we are with like used as a discourse marker or a quotative. So the new likes are actually not a singular like. There are a variety of them. But the thing that bothers people the most about them is they seem like they're non-semantic or non-meaningful. So if yeah. I say something such as um, like, I don't know about that where the like is at the beginning of a sentence, it, it doesn't really seem to add anything. So I could say, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know about that. And it would have the same semantic meaning, the same propositional content. But actually that like is a discourse marker. And what it's doing is it's acting as a linguistic focuser. It's saying, I'm here, I'm, I want you to pay attention. This is, I'm gonna mark this as something you should pay attention to. We also have a discourse marker like that's used as an approximator. And that's where it's used instead of something like about, um, where I'd say, yeah, he was like five years old, I think when that happened. And that is simply a replacement for about. So it's a one-to-one -one switch. You're not adding anything there. It's just a different mm -hmm. type of choice. And then the one that seems to be most despised is the quotative like where it's used instead of the verb to say. So that would be something such as, I was like, I don't know. And he was like, yeah, you do know that 
kind of use where you're quoting what someone said. What's really interesting about the quoted of like is it's the fastest growing new like use um, this century. And it's been likened to a black swan event, which is something like the pandemic or 9-11 that fundamentally changes the way we talk or the way we act. Because it seems to indicate a shift in narrative style over the last 50 years, where we've gone from just simple retellings of events where you, you report what someone was saying or what someone was doing, to more subjective performative aspects of talking about things, where you're also revealing your own thoughts or your subjective opinion about it. So we find that that kind of like mainly co-occurs with I or we subjects, because it's actually reporting not a direct quote, but a thought process. So it actually is performing a function very differently than what just using the verb to say would do. It's saying, this is not exact. This is simply my thought at the time and how I'm going to characterize this narrative versus if you use the verb to say, which someone could misconstrue as a direct quote. So while we might not dislike them, they have very significant functions and there is very little in the road that's going to block their progress. So in 50 years, I guarantee you that those likes will be as uh, sort of normal and used as the like we use in simile constructions today. Whether you're a seasoned designer or a total novice, with Visme, you can create engaging, dynamic, branded content that makes people ask, how did you do that? Visit tinyurl.com slash seizevisme to explore. If you're a small business owner or salesperson who struggles with getting the sales results you're looking for, grab a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon and wherever books are sold. And if you haven't seen all audible.com has to offer, you don't know what you're missing. Sign up for a free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. What about the like that is comes out of someone's mouth every other word? So it really <laughs> isn't related to anything. It's, well, I went to the so store and like he told me that, well, like, you know, I that kind of thing. That kind. Well, those are discourse markers. And even though people that don't use them might find them lacking a function, they actually do uh, do things like um, be give linguistic focus. So they orient a listener at where to pay attention or they approximate. So they're saying, I'm telling you something that's not exact, but it's an approximate estimate of, of what someone did or said. So people don't like those types of likes, but they do actually serve a linguistic function. I think the problem mm -hmm. is because there's several, there are several different likes that have emerged. Some speakers, especially young, very young speakers might use all of them at once. And that comes across as an overpopulation of like. What we find is there oh. is a um, adolescent peak in like use. So if you look at the studies, we find that as children track in age, they use a huge number of like early on. And then they actually reduce the numbers of likes they use in what's called an age graded progress as they get oh. older. So most of those over likes that you are hearing will probably reduce as those speakers age up. Um, I do know the speakers you're talking about. I think they're actually rarer than we tend to think about because we hear them and they drive us so crazy that we feel like <laughs> we populate. But speak, most speakers that use like use it in a measured degree and you probably don't even notice so much that they are actually like users. But yes, I would agree with that. I, I would so, totally agree with that. It, it, it isn't to say that people aren't using like, it's when they use it throughout and, and I hear what you're saying, that they're discourse markers and that they are serving a purpose for but the that speaker. doesn't mean you like them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And, you know, wow. some people just, they do, oh, you know, use a lot of them, they fall back. And what I think part of that is, uh, is when people get nervous sometimes. And a lot of times you'll find that cross-generationally or when you speak to someone who's a supervisor, a like is a fallback 
on, okay, I'm mitigating what I'm saying because I'm a little bit nervous mm. about saying anything bald and directive here. Um, and mm. so for people that use those, they probably don't use them at that high of a rate in their casual everyday speech, although there are some people that use it very frequently. However, as they age up, they will probably reduce the number that they use because the type of speaker you're talking about are generally um, under 30, right? You don't see a lot of 60 year olds yes. using like at that rate. Part of that's going to be that like been increasing over the last few decades so that younger speakers in general use more than older speakers, mm -hmm. but also that people will tend to fall into a more mature pattern of like use as they get into workplace environments or family environments where they are trying to be more linguistic models. Uh, so while there's nothing wrong with it from a linguistic perspective, it does not do well in an organizational perspective. So a lot of times people know that as they, as they get older and get higher positions and mm. they'll naturally reduce their own rate. Okay. Thank so you there's hope. That. There's hope on the horizon. <laughs> So glad. <laughs> you mentioned um, before that uh, that all of this, like sometimes it's related to how a product is named or how a uh, um, job description is created. That the the words that are used can either make people feel like it's meant for them or not. Can you? Give me a little, like an example of maybe a product naming or sure. company name. Sure. Now there, there's a whole field devoted to what's called sound symbolism, which is the theory that sounds themselves carry meaning for us. So we don't tend to think of, you know, an at sound meaning anything. We think of words meaning something, but this whole field of language study investigates how our brains might be sort of habitually programmed to associate certain kinds of feelings, emotions, ideas, shapes, size, associations, those kinds of things with actual sounds individually, and that that can affect consumer perception and branding. So a good example was a study that was done in the uh, Journal of, Con of Consumer Research, where they named a ice cream, a hypothetical ice cream, Frisch or Frosh. So you know, they, they said, what would you like in an ice cream name? They did a poll with consumers and, and described that ice cream that was named this thing. So they gave them the choice between Frisch and Frosh, and then they asked them to describe the ice cream. Well, people, when describing a rich, large tasting kind of really creamy ice cream, chose frosh mm -hmm. rather than fresh. Mm -hmm. And we find that that ac echo actually echoes what we know about the difference between front vowels and back vowels and how people emotionally respond to them. So frisch is with an E vowel, which is a front vowel. So if you make that sound E, you can feel that your mouth is kind of tight, right? And it's yeah. small. It's small. And what we find is E sounds tend to get associated with small things. So think about teeny, tiny, um, beetle, mm. smidge, bit, all of those words are small words, right? And they all yeah. have E-like vowels. However, ah and ah and o, oh, those are back vowels. And if you say them, ah, oh, you can see your mouth is open, more open and larger. And we find that people associate those things with deeper, larger, bigger kinds of um, associations. So it seems like naming an ice cream frosh brought up sort of this rich, deep, uh, larger flavor for an ice cream because of our association with those mm. vowel sounds. And this is not just a one off. We find this has been researched in a number of different contexts for a number of different types of either emotions, sizes, shapes, uh, those kinds of associations. And they all find that certain vowels in particular carry certain connotations. Uh, front vowels like E and I make us think of sharp, pointy, angular things. They make us think of happy things, which is probably because when you say the E sound, it uh, approximates the same musculature as smiling. Hmm. Um, so it's the same muscles that are involved. And so that's probably from habitual association. It brings up happy things. So if you name a product that's light and happy uh, with an E sound, consumers actually recall that product name more. If you name large objects with back vowel sounds like boat, 
for example, or ooh, um, like boot, they will actually remember those and find those more appealing. So there's some really interesting research on just the sounds you use in naming a product, helping determine whether consumers feel it fits the product and whether consumers will better remember the product. So consumer perception can be very much tied to simply the sound you choose. So that's one whole aspect of research. Then the other part you brought up was job descriptions and how we word things. And that's actually a different area of research. That's more on the implicit bias area. And those are actually words that you choose. Certain words just culturally become associated with certain types of people, certain types of uh, gender, certain types of age groups. And when we put those words, even when we do it without awareness in job descriptions, for example, um, or, or in communications within a company, we can actually narrow the field of who finds those to talk about them, who finds those relevant to their experience, who finds those making them want to apply for a job because those words are not associated with their group. Uh, example of this would be with gendered language in job placement ads. So uh, competitive, aggressive, assertive, those are adjectives that typically describe male traits. Even though women are often those, can often be those things, we associate those adjectives from a stereotypical perspective with masculinity. Mm -hmm. And when you put those in a job ad, we actually find that fewer women apply. Same thing if you put words like creative, co collaborative, co uh, cooperative, those tend to say feminine qualities, even though, again, they're not exclusively feminine traits, but stereotypically, those are the associations that our culture has made with those adjectives, and therefore you get fewer men that apply for those jobs. So those are just examples of word choice bias in advertisements that can affect uh, getting a quality applicant pool, for example. Boy, who knew? I know, just so many things, <laughs> <a> little time. <laughs> oh my gosh. So are there any um, positive <laughs> things that people are doing unintentionally with the way they're using language? Well, I think there's a, a we we the trick is we do a lot of things naturally that are uh, positive, right? That sort of evolve language. The problem is not all of us view them always the same way. So language changes. That's natural evolution, and that's the history of all languages. Or we wouldn't have. Uh, all these different languages, right? So romance languages, for example, are, are all related um, back in the day to English even as Proto-Indo-Germanic language, I mean, sorry, Proto-Indo-European languages. So we all started off with one proto-language that was sort of a European inclusive language that evolved over time because of differences among speakers and differences in geography and differences in our orientation as a communities into all these varied languages. So the idea that language change is bad is actually this funny idea that we carry with us, even though all of us participate in language change naturally. So this is something we do, even though we're not aware that we do it. So this is a positive because we actually carry language forward. Think of all the wonderful things we've done in English um, since it's no longer a Germanic language. We've invented airplanes and computers and the internet. So all of these things are obviously uh, requiring of, of higher cognitive processing. And we did it with a language that had changed drastically over the last thousand years. So obviously language change doesn't make us dumber, even though you could argue that from a syntactic and morphological perspective, English is a much simpler language than Old English because it's lost a lot of word endings. It has mm -hmm. uh, lost a lot of different sounds and, and organizational practices that Old English used to have. So if we go in with this theory that when you, you, know, you don't say something someone else does, it makes you ignorant or uneducated, that's actually a false theory. And the lovely thing is that language ignores all these beliefs that we have, and it just does its thing. So the positive mm -hmm. is really that whether we have these ideas about what good language is or bad language is, language doesn't care. It's out of the mouths of speakers that language evolves. And, and there's very little we can do to stop that. Um, the other positive thing is that we naturally start to get 
acclimatized to language change around us, even if we don't initially like it. And a good example of this would be something like a future tense, how we say future tense. So if you are going to tell me about something that you're doing in the future, give me an example of how you'd phrase it. I blank do something. Well, I will be, I will be going out to dinner tonight. Okay. How often do you really think you use will versus going to? How often do you think you say, I will go to dinner versus I'm going to go to dinner? Oh, I think I say I'm going to go to dinner. Right. So what's really interesting there is that's a a contemporary language change. A hundred years ago, will was the way you said things. That is actually one of these forms that has gone through this linguistic evolution. And now people, pretty much everybody says, I'm going to do this. You use will in maybe more formal circumstances or for certain types of business correspondence. But generally speaking, and almost all of us say, I'm going to do this. And Mm -hmm. if you look back over the history uh, of the last hundred years, that was led again by young women and younger speakers in general. So at every level of, of, of that change, you have found slightly higher use among young speakers and women, which indicates that that's where it started. But now it's spread through the hierarchy of class and gender and age so that everybody uses it without any problems and everybody accepts it. Mm -hmm. So that's a real positive change that has happened in terms of all of us moving in the same direction. And we tend to get so focused on where we don't move together that we lose sight of the places that we have moved together, which is the the vast majority Mm -hmm. of of language choices. Another one would be must versus need to or, or, or got to. I've got to do this is the way that almost all of us say things that indicate necessity, but a hundred years ago, you would have said must, which is called deontic modality, which is a big word simply for saying necessity. So the way that we talk about necessity has changed as well. And again, now it's pretty well accepted that you can say, I've got to do this and no one looks at you funny. So all these things that we kind of get upset with today, like like use, those will go that same path. And speakers just naturally evolve to accept them over time, even if it raises our hackles in contemporary speech. So I think all of those are positives. And we have become a lot more open as a culture. Think about just singular they use. Even though a lot of us may not say my pronoun is they, if we actually measure how most people talk about he or she during the day when it's an unknown reference, almost all of them say they. Yes. So this is a really positive change for inclusivity because we're not making people feel gendered. Uh, studies show that if you use a he pronoun where a she could be, she's don't see themselves there. So women don't see themselves included. A non-binary people might not see themselves included in those pronouns. Mm. You say them with a he, but naturally language has started to take care of that problem on its own. And, and you and I, when we go about our day, usually talk about they. Oh, if someone wants to do this, they can do X. Uh, and we're not even trying to be unbiased right. we just do that naturally. So those are all very positive advancements in language that we can point to that help us all sort of be more inclusive. Thank goodness. Right, <laughs> exactly. And, and I think we're more aware. We talk about language. I mean, this conversation would probably not have happened 20 years ago uh, because we didn't have an interest in that. We all, we sort of took an assumption mm-hmm. of, of a, a sort of the dominant types of language being the right one. So now we're looking at the ways different languages and different forms actually include and exclude, which wasn't happening in previous times. I totally agree with that. It is interesting that that it feels like we are a lot more sensitive to how words are received by other people. And, And I hope we are getting better at realizing that there's a lot we don't know you know if we have not walked a mile in someone's shoes we do not know what how they're going to respond or react to something so we need to listen when they tell us right i think you know one thing that we have done in the last 15 20 years is start to realize that different perspectives 
come to the same problem with different ideas, different ways of talking about it and different ways of communicating. And we Mm -hmm. have often seen things only through our eyes. And I think the last decade or two, we start to realize that not everybody is formed the way that we are. And so we need to open our minds to thinking about, well, how does someone else perceive this? And language is no different. We speak differently because we are different in our experience and language encodes experience. And so if my experience is from just the vantage point of where I grew up, that which can be geography, or it can be uh, class, or it can be ethnicity, or it can be gender. If I grew up with different factors influencing the experience I had, I will encode that in language differently. Um, And so I think we need to enlarge our perspective, and we have been drastically in terms of of the types of linguistic practices that we all take part in. Yes, I I agree with that. And I I totally agree. I think that is a great thing. I so appreciate this conversation. I think it's timely and yet evergreen and (laughs) (laughs) which is interesting. Uh, and, And really something we need to be paying attention to regardless of where we are in our work life or our regular life, because it it can really make a difference in the quality of conversations we have. Absolutely. And and I think the trick is a lot of times people, especially when you've been used to speaking a certain way or uh, with different kinds of ideas about what's good language or bad language, that you kind of get this perspective of, well, I, I don't want to change the way I speak and my, my speech is good and that is bad. And I think we just need to move away from that. No one needs to change the way they speak. I don't think when just being more open to understanding other people's perspective when they come mm-hmm. to talk to you is very different than saying that you have to accept that for your own, own speech. So that's not at all what linguists suggest. We're just saying that actually, if you look at the history of evolution of almost all the things that drive you crazy, it's a lot richer than you think. Um, Almost every speech feature that's despised probably out exists the ones that you yourself use. A great example of this is ask, right? We say the verb to ask. Of course, a shibboleth of sort of bad grammar and bad speech is to say ax, I axed him. Mm -hmm. But Chaucer axed, right? This was actually the original form of the verb. It was askion, um, or axion, back in Old English. And it went through a process of of something called metathesis, which is where sounds actually switch places. And the same process happened to the word bird, for example, which was brid, brid in older forms of English. And it went through a process of metathesis where it became pronounced bird. So actually, ask is the newer form, and act. Ax is the older form and was in literary use in Old English. So this idea that that's somehow bad grammar actually doesn't realize where that form came from. Uh, and it's socially less accepted today, but it's not mm. linguistically wrong. And so the fact that we're ignorant of linguistic history often causes us to judge the uses that people put different forms to as incorrect when actually they pre-existed the ones that we select. And we don't understand that language change happened and it happened to us and that's why we're different. So, you know, we sometimes just mm. need to step out of our, our own perspective and, and look at the long view uh, with language. And, and it's amazing how much we can learn about our own speech and that of others when we do that. Thank you so much for giving that example. That is fascinating. Oh, sure. No problem. Oh, so- my goodness. It, it so points out that and the like one. So point out that not knowing the history of language and how it evolves, um, you know, we definitely create value judgments that it sounds like are misplaced. Absolutely. And I think most people are really surprised. It may not change their mind about those features because they often become imbued deeply with societal prejudices, right, Mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, So we may still react badly to them, but we can't really criticize them the same way. So we have to come up with a different way. And so a lot of times we just have to realize, okay, I don't like this because I'm socially not 
finding this appropriate, which is a very different thing to then say, put it on that speaker and say, you're wrong. Because yeah. they're actually not. They're just socially dispreferred in their choice of linguistic terms, but that's a very different thing than being grammatically incorrect. Um, and most of the time, when we look back in the history of, of the development of linguistic forms, we find such fascinating stories about how they came to be. Uh, that's not only fun, but it's also enlightening with how we view it. Yeah. <laughs> so that my book actually that's coming out with Viking Penguin goes into sort of the ba back story of all these different features that we love to hate. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. And so when is the book coming out and does it have a title? Um, well, right. I, I, we haven't 100% decided on the title, but the working title right now is I hate when you say that because it's all about those things um, uh, that we hate when you say and like has its own chapter. <laughs> You'll be <I'll> happy. <laughs> Uh, so I'm I'm finishing up writing it right now, and then it takes about a year um, to go to press. So I think we're thinking fall of uh, 2023 right now. So it, it, I'll keep you posted. It, it'll be a while. But I I write about these topics a lot in things like Psychology Today or Nature, so people can keep tabs that way as well. That's so great! I can't wait for that book to come out. And yes, definitely keep me posted and. Valerie, thank you so much for spending this time and, and educating us on this. It was tremendously enlightening. Absolutely. It's always fun. I always love sharing these insights because it's, it's such a fast, it's still fascinating to me and I've been doing it for 25 years. Well, you it's can tell in the way that you communicate it, which is also really great. Um, will you tell the listeners how they can find you? And Sure, absolutely. Sort of uh, the easiest way is probably just go to my website, ValerieFriedland.com, uh, and then you can actually get on my mailing list if you want um, to find out when I'm giving talks or publishing articles and also keep track on the book. You can also find my blog, which is called Language in the Wild on Psychology Today. So you can uh, just Google Valerie Friedland Psychology Today or Language in the Wild Psychology Today, and I do a monthly column there. Um, and then you can also, if you're interested in hearing more about varied topics, you can just stream individual episodes of my language and society course with the great courses on pretty much any streaming service that you use. So iTunes, um, or you can find it on Amazon, or you can go to greatcourses.com. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you. And I'll make sure that that information is in the show notes. So everyone's got them. Yes. Yes. This is, this is great. Thank you so much for being here and spending this time. Absolutely. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, a production of Evergreen Podcasts. Discover more episodes of this podcast and explore others at evergreenpodcast.com. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And if you're looking to get your sales strategy headed in the right direction, pick up a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily.